On March 8, 2014, the world held its breath as Malaysian Flight 370 vanished without a trace. 227 passengers and 12 crew members aboard, seemingly swallowed by the enigmatic depths of the ocean. For years, this perplexing aviation enigma gripped the globe, sparking endless speculation, theories, and heartache. From shocking revelations about the aircraft's final moments to the astonishing twist in its flight path, join us as we unravel the mind-bending discoveries about Malaysian Flight 370 that changed everything. On March 8, 2014, at 12.42 a.m., a Malaysian Airlines Boeing 777-200ER took off from Kuala Lumpur and turned towards Beijing. It climbed to its cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. Malaysia Airlines, often abbreviated as MH370. The pilot of the plane was Farek Hamid, who was the first officer and was 27 years old at that time. This flight was Farek Hamid's final training flight, as he was about to complete his certification. His instructor, pilot-in-command Zahari Ahmad Shah, who was 53 years old, was one of the most experienced captains at Malaysia Airlines. In the cabin, there were 10 Malaysian flight attendants responsible for the well-being of 227 passengers, which included five children. The majority of the passengers were from China, and others came from Indonesia, Australia, India, France, the United States, Iran, Ukraine, Canada, New Zealand, the Netherlands, Russia, and Taiwan, in descending order. During that night, Captain Zahari managed the communication through the radios in the cockpit, while First Officer Farek was responsible for flying the plane. The plane's configuration followed standard procedures. Zahari's transmissions were a bit unusual. He radioed at 1.01 a.m., stating that they had leveled off at 35,000 feet. This report was unnecessary as the airspace was already under radar surveillance. Normally, planes report their altitude when they arrive at a location, not when they leave it. At 1.08 a.m., the flight crossed the Malaysian coastline and headed towards Vietnam across the South China Sea. Zahari once again reported the plane's altitude as 35,000 feet, 11 minutes later. As the plane approached a waypoint near the Vietnam border, the controller at Kuala Lumpur Center radioed Malaysia 370 to contact Ho Chi Minh on a frequency of 120.9. Zahari replied and confirmed that he was Malaysian 370, but he didn't read back the frequency as he should have. However, the rest of the transmission sounded normal. Unfortunately, there were no further communications from MH370. The pilots didn't check in with Ho Chi Minh or respond to any subsequent attempts to contact them. Primary radar uses unprocessed pings from objects in the sky, while secondary radar, used in air traffic control systems, relies on transponder signals from each aeroplane. Secondary radar provides more information, such as the aeroplane's identity and altitude. Just five seconds after MH370 entered Vietnamese airspace, the symbol for its transponder vanished from the screens of Malaysian air traffic control. Then. 37 seconds later, the entire plane disappeared from the secondary radar. This happened at 1.21 a.m., about 39 minutes after takeoff. The air traffic controller in Kuala Lumpur was busy with other planes on the screen and didn't notice. When he finally did, he assumed the plane was being handled by Ho Chi Minh in an area beyond his reach. Meanwhile, Vietnamese controllers saw MH370 entering their airspace and then saw it vanish from the radar. They seemed to misunderstand an agreement that required them to promptly inform Kuala Lumpur if a handed-off aeroplane was more than five minutes late in checking in. They tried to contact the plane multiple times, but couldn't reach it. About 18 minutes after MH370 disappeared from their radar, they called Kuala Lumpur to report the situation. What followed was a display of confusion and incompetence. The Aeronautical Rescue Coordination Center in Kuala Lumpur should have been notified within an hour of the plane's disappearance, but this hadn't happened even by 2.30 a.m. Finally, at 6.32 a.m., an emergency response was launched. By that time, four hours had passed, and the plane, which was supposed to have reached Beijing, had not yet been located. Initially, the search efforts focused on the South China Sea, the area between Malaysia and Vietnam. This involved a joint international endeavor with 34 ships and 28 aircraft from seven different countries. 
Despite these efforts, MH370 remained elusive and could not be found. But what could be the main reasons behind the vanishing of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370? In recent times, scientists have made profoundly unsettling new findings regarding the ill-fated Flight 370 incident. These discoveries are poised to significantly alter our comprehension of this disaster, offering profound insights into the circumstances surrounding the incident. Number 15. Perplexing Flight Trajectory Radar data obtained from air traffic control computers, combined with classified information from the Malaysian Air Force, showed that once MH370 disappeared from the secondary radar, it made a sharp turn towards the southwest. Then it reversed its path across the Malay Peninsula and circled around the island of Penang. From there, the aircraft headed in a northwest direction, passing over the Malacca Strait and eventually vanishing from radar coverage over the Andaman Sea. This part of the flight lasted over an hour, indicating that this incident was unlike a typical hijacking or any previously seen accident or pilot suicide scenario. The investigation of MH370 led the authorities in unexpected and unfamiliar directions right from the beginning. The mystery surrounding MH370 has been under investigation for a long time, and the public has been speculating intensely. Families all over the world were devastated by the loss. The idea that a highly advanced aircraft with modern instruments and redundant communications could just disappear seems unlikely. It's hard to permanently delete an email and living off the grid is nearly impossible, even if one tries to do so deliberately. A Boeing 777 is designed to have constant electronic access, so the plane's vanishing act has led to various theories. Some of these theories are absurd, but they gain traction because it's unusual for commercial aeroplanes to vanish in today's world. Despite Malaysian officials' immediate denials and the Malaysian Air Force's attempts to confuse the situation, the truth about the plane's strange flight path began to surface quickly. Number 14. MH370's Elusive Communication with Inmarsat For six hours following the plane's disappearance from the radar, MH370 occasionally communicated with a stationary satellite over the Indian Ocean. This satellite was managed by a company called Inmarsat, located in London. This suggests that the plane did not encounter a sudden catastrophic event. It is believed that the plane continued flying at a high speed and altitude throughout these six hours. This was possible because certain communication systems, such as passenger equipment, cockpit technology, and automated maintenance reports, had been deliberately turned off or disconnected. The interactions with the Inmarsat satellite were brief electronic signals like faint whispers of communication. In total, there were seven instances of connection. Two were automatically initiated by the plane and five were initiated by the Inmarsat ground station. Additionally, two satellite phone calls were made, both without response but providing more details. Most of these communications were linked to the two values that HEMA had recently started recording. Number 13 the Doppler values clue to the plane's path. The analysis of technical data shows that the plane likely turned toward the south. This idea is strongly supported by the second recorded value from Inmarsat, which we'll refer to as the Doppler value. This Doppler value is crucial because it includes an important measurement of how the plane's frequency changes due to its high-speed movement in relation to the satellite's position. This is a normal part of how airplanes communicate with satellites while in flight. To make this communication work smoothly, the changes in frequency need to be predicted and adjusted for by the aeroplane systems. However, this adjustment isn't perfect because satellites, especially as they get older, might not always send signals exactly as the planes expect. Factors like the tilt of the satellite's orbit and temperature can also affect the signals they transmit. These issues leave noticeable marks on the data. Number 12. Decrypting the High-Speed Descent even though Doppler shift logs had never been used to pinpoint an aeroplane's location before, in Marset, technicians in London managed to detect a significant distortion indicating a turn to the south at 2.40 a.m. The turning point was located north and west of Sumatra, which is the northernmost island of Indonesia. Despite some analytical uncertainty, it is assumed that the aeroplane flew straight and level for a very long time in the general direction of Antarctica, which was beyond its range. After six hours, the Doppler data revealed a steep descent that was up to five times faster than the normal descent rate. 
The plane plunged into the ocean within a minute or two after crossing the seventh arc, possibly shedding components before impact. Based on the electronic evidence, it appears that this was not a planned water landing. Instead, the plane must have shattered into countless pieces in an instant. However, at this point, no one knew where or why the impact occurred, and there was no physical evidence to support the satellite interpretations. Number 11. Recovering Flight MH370's Black Boxes The Wall Street Journal was the first to report about the satellite transmissions, which happened less than a week after the plane's disappearance. The report suggested that the plane had probably stayed in the air for hours, even after going silent. Malaysian officials eventually admitted that the report was true. Malaysia's government had been accused of being highly corrupt in the region and was also known for its secretive, fearful, and untrustworthy behavior during the investigation of the flight. The chaos faced by accident investigators from Europe, Australia, and the United States was astounding. This was because the Malaysians withheld information and initially focused the sea searches in the wrong location, the South China Sea, resulting in no floating debris being found. If the Malaysians had been truthful from the beginning, debris might have been discovered, helping to narrow down the plane's approximate location, and the black boxes could have been recovered. The search for them underwater finally led to a small section of the ocean located thousands of miles away. However, even though it was a narrow area, the ocean is immense. It took two years to locate the black boxes from Air France 447, which had crashed into the Atlantic during a flight from Rio de Janeiro to Paris in 2009. The searchers had a precise idea of where to look, but it still took nearly two months of unsuccessful attempts before they shifted their focus to the deeper parts of the ocean. The initial search on the surface waters concluded on April 2014. Even though the Malaysians were officially responsible for the whole investigation, they didn't have enough capabilities and knowledge to conduct a deep-sea search and recovery operation. Fortunately, the Australians, being responsible global citizens, stepped forward and took the lead in the areas of the Indian Ocean that the satellite data pointed to. The region was incredibly deep and unexplored, presenting the initial challenge of mapping the underwater terrain accurately. Only then could side-scanning sonar vehicles be towed safely, many miles beneath the ocean's surface. The ocean floor was filled with ridges in complete darkness, where no light had ever reached before. Number 10. The Planned Flight Vanishing An intriguing revelation emerges regarding the perplexing events surrounding Malaysian Flight 370, indicating a meticulously orchestrated scheme rather than the conventional attributions of a mishap. The enigmatic flight trajectory, devoid of electronic correspondence, defies easy categorization as a mere consequence of technical malfunction or human lapse. Traditional explanations, encompassing an array of possibilities such as computer glitches, control system collapse, environmental disturbances like ice, lightning, or bird strikes, and even the most remote occurrences like meteorites or volcanic ash, flounder in accounting for the intricate flight path. Remarkably, the gamut of potential mechanical and human-centric failures, spanning from sensors to radio equipment, and from instrument to electrical systems, all fall short of encapsulating the deliberate nature of this flight's deviation. Even scenarios entailing fire, smoke, explosive decompression, cargo detonation, or pilot incapacitation fail to unravel the layers of intent woven into this baffling occurrence. The absence of precedents like pilot confusion, medical exigency, or external threats like bombs or wartime acts further accentuates the mystique. Number 9. The Unlikely Scenario Contrary to popular belief, the control of the plane was not taken remotely from the electrical equipment bay located beneath the forward galley. Instead, it was controlled from inside the cockpit. This happened between 1.01 a.m. when the plane reached an altitude of 35,000 feet and 1.21 a.m. when it disappeared from secondary radar. During this 20-minute period, the aircraft's automatic condition reporting system sent its regular 30-minute update to the airline's maintenance department via satellite. This update included information about the fuel level, altitude, speed, and geographic position, as well as any anomalies. The transmission showed that the aeroplane's satellite communication system was operational at that time. 
Given the unlikelihood of two pilots acting together in such a manner, it is probable that by the time the plane disappeared from secondary radar, one of the pilots was either unable to function, deceased, or had been locked out of the cockpit. Primary radar detected both military and civilian aircraft. Subsequent investigation showed that the pilot of MH370 likely disabled the autopilot as the tight turn to the southwest was too precise to be executed by automated systems. Additionally, it appears that the person in control intentionally depressurized the plane and turned off a significant portion, if not all, of the electrical system around the same time. The reason behind this action remains unclear, but it had the unintended consequence of temporarily disrupting the satellite link. Number 8. High Altitude Intrigue Mike, an electrical engineer based in Boulder, Colorado, also an important member of an independent group, has thoroughly studied radar data related to an aeroplane. He strongly believes that during a turn, the plane climbed to an altitude of 40,000 feet, which was close to its maximum limit. During this manoeuvre, the passengers on board would have experienced the sensation of being pushed back into their seats due to the G-forces. Mike's theory is that the climb was deliberately done to rapidly depressurize the plane, leading to the quick incapacitation and death of everyone in the cabin. This intentional depressurization was likely done as a means of controlling any potential unruly behavior during the long hours of the flight. The effects of depressurization would have gone unnoticed in the cabin if it hadn't been for the sudden appearance of drop-down oxygen masks. These masks were designed for emergency use, lasting no more than 15 minutes at altitudes below 13,000 feet. At the high cruising altitude of 40,000 feet, the cabin occupants would have become incapacitated and lost consciousness within minutes. There would have been no choking or gasping for air. The deceased passengers would have remained secure in their seats, with their faces nestled in the useless oxygen masks hanging from the ceiling. The scene would have been dimly lit by emergency lights. In contrast, the cockpit was equipped with four pressurized oxygen masks that could supply oxygen for several hours. Any individual who intentionally depressurized the plane could have easily used one of these masks to continue breathing safely. The plane was zooming quickly. It showed up on the main radars as a mysterious dot getting closer to Penang Island at nearly 600 miles per hour. The land nearby is where Butterworth Air Base is located. This base has a group of Malaysian F-18 fighter jets and a radar for air defense. But it seemed like nobody was really paying much attention to all of this. Number 7. Behind Closed Cockpit Doors Another idea about the MH370 vanishing is about the captain. Could it have been the captain who took over without using force? Some people might not like the thought that a pilot would harm innocent passengers to end their own life. But this isn't such a strange idea. It has happened before. In 1997, the captain of Silk Air, an airline from Singapore, was thought to have turned off the important recorders in a Boeing 737 before crashing it into a river at very high speeds. In 1999, the co-pilot of Egypt's Air Flight 990 purposefully crashed it into the sea near Long Island, killing everyone on board. Just a month before My 370 disappeared, the captain of Mozambique Airlines Flight 70 crashed his plane from a high flying level, killing everyone. The most recent case is the German Wings Airbus, which intentionally crashed into the French Alps on March 24, 2015, killing everyone on board. The co-pilot, Andreas Lubitz, locked the pilot out of the cockpit while he went to the bathroom. Lubitz had been sad before and had looked into the MH370's vanishing a year earlier. It is challenging to consider the co-pilot as the one responsible for the MH370 incident. He was a young and hopeful individual, apparently looking forward to getting married. There was no record of any conflicts or doubts related to his descent. Additionally, he was not a German pilot joining a struggling low-cost airline with low pay and prestige. He was piloting a majestic Boeing 777 in a country where the national airline and its pilots are highly respected. Number 6. The Disturbing Truth About Captain Zahari There are concerns about the Captain Zahari, portrayed in official reports as an exemplary pilot and a calm family man who enjoyed playing with flight simulators. 
This is the image his family promotes, but there are numerous indications of trouble that have been blatantly ignored. The police discovered details about Zahari's life that should have prompted a deeper investigation, but the formal conclusions reached were insufficient. Zahari's ability to handle work-related stress was rated as good, and there was no previous evidence of apathy, anxiety, or irritability. His lifestyle, interpersonal relationships, and family stresses had not significantly changed. There were no behavioral signs of social isolation, changes in habits or interests. When studying his behavior on the day of the flight, and the previous three flights through CCTV recordings at the airport, Zahari appeared consistent, well-groomed, and well-dressed. His normal characteristics, including his posture, facial expressions, and mannerisms, remained the same. However, this official report seems either irrelevant or contradictory to what was known about Zahari, given the troubling indications that were overlooked. His life was filled with sadness and loneliness. His wife had left him, and he spent much time alone, waiting for the days between flights to pass. He had feelings for a married woman with three children, and he also became fixated on two young internet models he found on social media. His attempts to connect with them went unanswered, and some of his comments were inappropriate. His life had changed drastically, and he felt distant from his once stable and well-established life. Excessive use of social media may have contributed to his isolation. Experts believe he suffered from clinical depression. The FBI found evidence on his flight simulator suggesting a flight pattern similar to MH370, but Malaysian investigators didn't give it much importance, although it might be significant. Now, it's time for today's subscriber pick. In September 2019, while investigators were still trying to find the missing MH370, Ian Wilson, a British video producer, had a different idea. He thought the plane might have crashed in a faraway jungle, making it hard to find. Using satellite maps, Ian looked at rainforests in Southeast Asia and found something that looked like an aeroplane deep in the Cambodian jungle, about 60 miles west of Phnom Penh. The pictures showed the plane appearing to be stuck against a mountain at an angle. Some aeroplane parts from MH370 were found in the Indian Ocean, but only a few were confirmed to be from it. People still doubted the ocean crash theory. Ian and his brother Jackie decided to explore what they found. They faced problems during the trip, and their guides turned back due to dangerous terrain. However, the brothers remained sure about their discovery. An aviation expert, Lieutenant Tim McMillan, said the object looked like an aeroplane, but seemed too small to be a Boeing 777. In the end, experts confirmed it wasn't MH370. It was a different plane. Despite this, Ian and Jackie still believe in their find and hope to try again when they have enough money. Let us know your thoughts about what we just showed you. Number 5. MH370's Puzzling Flight Simulation Victor Ianello, an innovative entrepreneur hailing from Roanoke, Virginia, has gained recognition as a prominent member of an independent group and has conducted extensive analyses of simulated flights. His focus is on the flight of Malaysian Airlines MH370, which the Malaysian investigators seemingly overlooked. What stands out to Ianello is that Zahari, the pilot, did not run MH370's path as a continuous flight on the simulator. Instead, Zahari manually advanced the flight in stages, repeatedly jumping forward and adjusting fuel until the plane vanished. Ianello firmly believes Zahari is responsible for what happened. It's important to note that there was no technical reason for Zahari to practice this on a Microsoft consumer product-like game. Thus, Ianello suspects that the simulator flight served as a way for Zahari to say goodbye, leaving behind a breadcrumb trail. While we may not fully comprehend Zahari's reasoning without an explanation, we cannot dismiss the simulator flight as a mere coincidence. According to Ianello, it holds significance in understanding the events surrounding MH370's disappearance. Number 4. The Hijack Theory Unveiled While some theories suggest that the flight captain could be responsible for the incident, others propose that a passenger hijacked the plane after sneaking on board, the idea emerged when investigators, who were looking into the Malaysia Airlines flight's disappearance, found a mysterious 14 stone, that is a 196-pound load, added to the flight list after takeoff. Mr. Jaslin, whose wife and two children were on the flight, mentioned that French investigators revealed this cargo discovery in a report about the passengers and baggage. 
According to Mr. Waterloo, who shares the belief that the flight was intentionally brought down, the French newspaper La Parisienne reported that a container on the flight was also found to be overloaded. However, no explanation was provided for this. Additionally, it was discovered that an unknown load of 89 kilos was added to the flight list after takeoff, and the container was overloaded without any clear reason. It is unclear whether these actions were due to incompetence or manipulation, and everything remains possible. These questions will likely be part of the inquiries involving the Malaysians. According to aviation security expert Tim Termini, there is strong support for the theory that a hijacking likely occurred. There are four possible scenarios for the hijack. The first involves a crew member taking control. The second involves a passenger as the hijacker. The third, although uncommon, is a stowaway. And the fourth is the aircraft being taken over remotely through an electrical system. However, in 2018, Philippa Baum, editor of the academic journal Aviation Security International and an aviation security professor, pointed out that officials were reluctant to entertain the idea of a stowaway. Baum believed that the possibility of a stowaway should be seriously considered, as officials seemed unwilling to even think about it. Number 3. A Cyber Heist in the Air Respected historian Norman Davis proposes another closely related idea to this. He suggests that the flight might have been remotely hacked and diverted to a secret location. According to Davis, cyber experts may have taken advantage of technology designed to prevent a repeat of the 9-11 terror attacks. This technology allowed hijacked planes to be controlled from the ground. The specific technology mentioned is the Boeing Honeywell Uninterruptible Autopilot, as described in his book Beneath Another Sky, A Global Journey into History. The existence of this technology raises the possibility of a terrifying scenario. Davis believes that the plane could have been carrying sensitive material or personnel bound for Beijing, making it a target for two kidnapping attempts. Since no definitive answers have been provided, Davis finds it acceptable to speculate on the matter. According to Davis, the sequence of events might have involved the plane being remotely kidnapped by a hacker first, who intended to divert it to the U.S. naval base in Diego Garcia, located in the Indian Ocean. Subsequently, another hacker or remote controller may have taken over the plane to prevent it from reaching its intended destination. Number 2. Conspiracy in the Skies Some experts suggest that MH370 might have been shot down during a joint military training exercise between Thailand and the U.S. in the South China Sea, which happened around the time the plane disappeared. This could have happened due to miscommunication, a malfunction, or human error. A former French airline director named Marc Tegain claimed to have seen satellite images of unidentified aircraft in that area during MH370's disappearance. He also mentioned receiving threats from anonymous sources warning him not to pursue this theory, suggesting a connection to mistaken identity. Another theory proposes that MH370 was accidentally shot down by a country's military, thinking it was a hostile or suspicious aircraft. This confusion could have been triggered by the plane deviating from its original course, losing communication, or resembling another aircraft. Nigel Cawthorn, a British author, even suggested that U.S. Thai fighters shot down MH370, fearing it was heading toward their military base in Diego Garcia Island, Indian Ocean. He also speculated that sensitive cargo or personnel aboard the plane might have attracted attention or hostility. Some conspiracy theories go as far as suggesting that MH370's downing was part of a cover-up operation orchestrated by a state actor for political or strategic reasons. This could involve creating a diversion, blaming another country, or retrieving valuable items from the aircraft. Selena Waterloo, a French relative of one of the passengers, alleged that the U.S. Air Force shot down MH370 to seize electronic equipment bound for China, and an international cover-up was carried out to hide the truth. However, there are several challenges and criticisms of these theories. The lack of solid evidence or a clear motive for a shootdown makes it hard to prove these claims. There is no proof of any missile or fighter jet being near Mi-370 or any state actor having the intention to shoot it down. The satellite images and anonymous threats mentioned have not been verified by official sources. Additionally, Shooting down a civilian plane and covering it up would require significant coordination, authorization, legal consequences, and a massive conspiracy, making it difficult to believe without any leaks or whistleblowers. 
Number 1. Ringtone Theory According to another theory, some believe that the plane, which was believed to have crashed and disappeared in the Indian Ocean, couldn't have actually sunk. This idea stems from the fact that many relatives of the passengers reported hearing a ringing tone coming from their loved one's phones for up to four days after the supposed crash. In fact, 19 families have shared such experiences. One poignant example of this was when a family member demonstrated on Chinese television that he could still call his deceased brother's phone, and it would ring. This has led a telecommunications expert named Paul Franks to support the ringtone theory. He firmly believes that if the plane had indeed crashed into the ocean, the phones would not have continued to function and ring for that long. Franks explained his views on Reddit, stating that when a phone is submerged, especially in seawater, it is almost impossible for it to survive and remain operational. Even if somehow it did survive, it wouldn't receive any signals from the ocean's depths. Based on all of this evidence, it strongly suggests that the plane did not crash into the sea after all. Do you believe that Malaysian Flight 370's disappearance was a result of human error, intentional actions, or an unforeseen natural disaster? Leave your answer in the comments below. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.